Welcome back to the show. I'm so excited. Today we have a really fun personality that I think you'll enjoy getting to know. We have Corey Peltier here with us. And one of my team members, Heather Brand, is the one that introduced me to Corey. And I've been following him on his newsletter, Substack. Um, it's been fantastic. You have a hilarious sense of humor in the way you write and talk about mathematics that I really resonate with because humor is something we really value at Made for Math. So welcome. I'm so glad you're here, Corey. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this is going to be great. So really quick, just share a little bit about you and how you got started in this work. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I actually wanted to be a high school math teacher. That was always my passion. And uh, for whatever reason, I ended up going through uh, public education through up through middle school. And I think I just wasn't set up well. So I never took calculus in high school. Mm. And so uh, at Maryland, I tested into Calc 1 and uh, to do to at the time, in order to teach high school math, you had to major in mathematics. And so I struggled so mightily in Calc 1. And uh, and I also was an 18 year old freshman not doing the best schoolwork. And yeah. so I ended up switching out, which I kind of regret because I honestly think I could have done it. And I ended up switching into elementary education and just took a bunch of extra math courses. But I was an elementary education major, had a kind of like an emphasis in mathematics so I could teach middle school math. And I ended up getting a job teaching fifth grade and I mm -hmm. loved it. Teaching fifth grade was so much fun. And uh, we spent a lot of the year on fractions. We had just adopted the common core state standards when mm -hmm. I was teaching. So there was a major emphasis on that. And as I was teaching, I realized how much it kind of, uh, I was just sad that kids were leaving and then seeing some of the math skills they were coming into, I got more interested in perhaps pursuing something working with pre-service teachers. And that's what ended up yeah. getting me into the realm of higher education, which is what I do now. But one of the things I was, as I mentioned, I was elementary ed. I got into special education because my first year, I think roughly half of the students in my class had an indi uh, individualized education program. And then I mm -hmm. had a couple other students who had 504 plans. And I realized that that one intro to SPED course, a lot of universities offer is woefully inadequate. And Absolutely. so I started taking some uh, special education courses as part of a master's. And I realized a lot of the strategies they talk about within the special education program was not what I got during my elementary education program. And they were very effective for a lot of students in my class, even the students not identified as receiving special education services. And so that kind of just funneled me down that path, that pathway that I pursued further. Oh, I really like that. And I think that's interesting that you mentioned, you know, it kind of scared you off the calculus one. I had a similar experience in college. I was in teacher education for elementary education, and they were trying to recruit me into math education as my major focus. And I, same as you, like, no, I don't think I can survive that. And in hindsight, I wish I would have stuck with it because I think well, they saw so funny. something. It's so funny because that doing um, the grad degree and then obviously a PhD, I took like almost every stats course that could be offered. Mm -hmm. And so much of calculus is embedded within all of statistics. And like going back now, um, it makes so much sense. But at the time being 18 years old, yeah. having the prerequisite knowledge, uh, even of like pre-calc, like I don't think I was the strongest knowledge. I, I still remember the professor gave us a... Uh, uh, he called it, what did he call it? I forget exactly what he called it, but we took a test the very first week of class on pre-calc uh, content and our class average was a 50 and he goes, well, y'all aren't ready to take this class and he just kept trucking along. Um, <laughs> and it was honestly, yeah, it was just an interesting experience. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately we see a lot of that in the college classrooms, but I love that you're there and you want to work with pre-service teachers. I'm sure you're working actively to change some of that because I think it has a huge impact. I think all of us can relate to being woefully undertrained and helping these kids with different learning needs. So I'm so excited. Well, recently you wrote a really good article and I loved the title. It was Fluency, all cap letters, because the NCTM had released a statement about fluency 
and it got you hopping because it was really dismissive of what you and I have observed about what's effective with fluency. And when we were talking about fluency for those parents that are listening, and we're talking about being able to use math flexibly in an accurate way, in a relatively quick way too. Fluency has a pretty big definition. And so I really enjoyed your article. So I kind of want to dig into that with you today because I think a lot of educators are confused about what to do because they're hearing, don't do any time tests. Don't do this. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. But you make so many good claims here. So can you explain a little bit why the NCTM statement got you so hopped up and frustrated about the recommendations that are making? Yeah, I think the uh, one of the biggest issues, um, and I actually want to give a shout out to my friend Jenny Root, who's at Florida State. She's been hosting some inter, uh, like getting math education people and special education people to actually meet and have conversations. Because I think a lot of the times we are talking past one another. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain terms we might use that uh, each side might interpret that differently. And so sometimes you can't even begin to have a productive dialogue around how to best teach kids when you can't actually converse. And so I would argue some of the same things happened in the NCTM statement that was put out. Not everything they said in there was terrible, right? But right. There, it's it's more about when, the when and uh, how we are going to use specific practices. And some of the recommendations that were being put out are great when we're thinking about students generalizing knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, to become flexible, right? We mm -hmm. all want students to be very flexible and not just going to the, uh, the the one specific procedure, but in order to get to that point of being able to pick and choose what strategy or procedure is best situated for a problem, students need to have mastered those. And that is a point that I think is just missing in a lot of this conversation. And we never get students to true mastery of math facts or individual procedures to then allow them to select the best procedure given a problem. Yeah, I agree. I think you're so spot on with that. And I love that you bring up like that there's a miscommunication about how we're defining these things. And I think that happens in a lot of contexts. I just did an interview um, with researcher Giannis and in reflecting on our conversation, I was realizing he has a very different definition of what explicit instruction looked like than me. And mm -hmm. I thought, okay, that's interesting. So I wanna follow up with him and ask him more about that because I think he's thinking it's more um, telling the child explicitly what to say and when to say and all of that. And he is saying, oh, I think we're doing a disservice to kids teaching them that way. And so my definition of explicit instruction is a little bit different, right? It's not as stringent as what he's maybe be thinking in his mind. So I think that's a really awesome thing that you're bringing up that we have to get more in alignment with some of the language we're using and how we're applying it to students for sure. Yeah, it comes uh, specifically that article I wrote, it all comes down to what does the word fluency mean? And um, if you look at a lot of the behavioral literature uh, out of um, behavior analysis, fluency has a pretty rich description history within there where mm -hmm. it's, the speed, it's the speed and accuracy of behavioral responses. And that those core dimensions aren't they seem to be minimized, at least in some of the writing by the NCTM when they were writing about procedural fluency, and they were focusing much more on the flexibility side of it. And this is where I just would, I think we can talk together about some of these things. It's, a, it's ensuring like basic facts, four plus five, a kid being able to say nine automatically is always going to be more useful to that child than having to use some counting procedure, because mm -hmm. the counting procedure is going to be laborsome because and this is something we all agree on. A student just being able to quickly say nine is not the end goal of mathematics. That's mm -hmm. not the end goal. Any Anyone, none yeah. of us are saying that's the end goal, but that is an essential, uh, an essential skill to be able to have those facts memorized in order to do a host of other mathematics efficiently. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's about ordering things, perhaps refocusing on the order of getting those facts and procedures fluent and mastered to then think about applying them flexible, uh, flexibly, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think that that ordering is one of the biggest issues 
in my mind to begin to like do more research in number one to inform our knowledge, but then also to help teachers understand if, if a kid's having a hard time applying something flexibly, maybe we can drill back down and realize it kind of is a fact issue and we Mm -hmm. need to make sure those facts are mastered. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think, um, the NCTM mentioned that like memorization was a poor way to achieve math back fluency. So, and I think a lot of us, especially with like how I grew up doing math backs and you too, probably Corey, it was just like mad minute. It was all timed. It was, you know, not a whole lot of reasoning behind it. Um, so can you think, or can you explain a little bit more about what you, how memorization has a place in this instruction? Because it does. Um, but obviously doing mad minute is maybe not efficient. Can you explain a little bit more? Yeah. So, um, uh, you could take a child with no concept of addition and you could probably get them to memorize, Hey, if you see the numbers four, five, and nine, they exist in a contingency. Four plus five is nine. They would, that child might have zero concept of what is happening. No one is advocating for that, right? Mm -hmm. We only, it it reminds me, uh, I know there's a lot of controversy around trying to even draw parallels between reading and math, but I'm going to make one really quickly now. Okay, do. Um, When you think about reading, you have high frequency words, right? And Mm -hmm. we want students to be able to quickly identify high frequency words without having to sound them out, right? And this is where you can get into the whole conversation about what is sight word instruction and everything. But in a lot of the recommendations for high quality reading instruction, you don't start trying to do a lot of uh, sight word type instruction until students can actually decode a CVC word because then students actually know that there is a code to unlock, right? Mm -hmm. Well, go back to math now, We're not going to be focusing on doing a lot of flashcard type drill, like flashcard type instructional drill of math facts, or even the mad minutes, which I'll talk about in a second. None of that's going to happen until there's clearly a students have a clear understanding what addition comprises, which we have a join model of addition. We have part, part, whole model of addition. We want students to have those and understand that hey, if I see four plus five and I don't know the answer, I do have this backup strategy of counting on, right? Like, Mm -hmm. or using the commutative property of saying, oh, it's going to be more efficient for me to start at five and count up four versus starting at four. All that is great. (laughs) But when students know these things are, I, I know that this is a concept, I can solve it, beginning to focus on pairing, um, doing some sort of flash type drill under time conditions is going to be beneficial because if we don't do it and you give kids all the time in the world, they're going to just keep using the strategy because it's easier. We don't want to try to practice retrieving something from memory. It's easier for us to default to this counting procedure um, because we can have our, use our fingers. Um, And so it's all about that pairing, right? Like when do we actually incorporate this idea of, oh, no, we're going to try to do four plus five, and I want you to try to answer it within two seconds, not using your counting strategy. And if you do it too early, it's clearly frustrating, and it's going to be pointless, because that idea of four plus five is nine is not grounded in uh, this understanding of having part-whole relations or uh, right. the join model of addition. Yeah, that's so, so good. I'm so glad that you brought that up. And the whole mad minute thing. Um what do you yeah, so you can I talk a little bit about that? For, Please. So, um, I actually have a lot of, I have a lot of mixed feelings about those because there's some people who just want to ban them outright. And I think right. that is, uh, I don't think ugh, they can be beneficial, but you begin to think through if they're used so widespread poorly, is it a bad thing to ban them because they're being used poorly so widespread? And so this is where I, I hear, like, if you're giving every kid in your class, like, let's say you're teaching, I taught fifth grade, right? A lot, most of the fifth graders I taught with were not proficient in their multiplication facts or division facts, which inherently hampered everything we we're doing with fraction, finding common denominators, converting mixed fractions to improper fractions, all of that inherently rely, uh, required them to be fluent facts and they weren't. Well, if I gave every kid in the class the same mad minute sheep, that would be terrible, right? Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. For maybe, for maybe I'm going to make up numbers here, but maybe a third of the class, that sheet and the items included on it was a good match for them, right? Mm -hmm. That given where they were instructionally with being able to do this, it would be perfect. And those third, third, fourth of the class would be fine. For another third of the class, it was going to be way too difficult. So even if you think, even if you're not wasting, not spending a lot of time doing them, so you're only doing maybe, uh, two to four minutes a day of practice, that two to four minutes was wasted for those students because the items on that sheet were too difficult and they don't know what they are. Yeah. And then you probably have another, there might be another grouping of kids in your class who already mastered their facts and that was a waste of time for them as well, where you mm -hmm. could be doing some of the flexibility or closed type problems that would be more beneficial for them. And so it all becomes down to how can we differentiate practice um, of, math facts in an efficient way that is going to be uniquely situated for each student. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of one of the biggest challenges is I see poor implementation, which is why a lot of people are like, let's get rid of it, but it is necessary. We need to do some sort of uh, practice and it's all just retrieval practice, right? Yeah. It's here's, a, yeah. here's an item practice retrieving it under time conditions so that the student is not continually using the counting, accounting, some sort of heavy laborsome counting procedure. And because uh, there's someone at Oklahoma State named Brian Ponce, him and uh, Gary Duhon, along with a couple other folks, have done a lot of um, math fact practice. That's like all they research. How can we get kids to learn math facts as quickly as possible? And literally what they found is four minutes a day was the that was that was all you needed to actually see meaningful benefits. That's amazing. Minutes, yeah, two minutes of practice at the beginning of math, two minutes of practice at the end of the math class, and so that's what kind of boggles my mind sometimes. Is no one is saying let's take all, half of a fifty-minute block of class to practice math facts. It's like no, we literally just need a little bit of time. Absolutely. And use it well. Yeah. Um, and you're going to see change. Everything else that's happening in that class that might be focused a lot more on concept building or whatever else math uh, the curriculum has uh, created or the teachers are doing, it's going to be helpful. But kids are going to learn more with those facts being uh, automatic for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. One thing that we do to help kids learn that fluency, but still be working on that grade level appropriate uh, content is we do focus facts. So a focus fact to us is we, you know, uh, do an assessment, figure out what facts do they not have. Instead of teaching using multiplication, all of the sevens times tables and practicing, practicing all of them, we narrow it down. We're only focusing on learning up to seven times four, and then we'll add another one right over time. But the other thing that we've been doing is um, if we're doing fraction work, like you were talking about, Everything has to do with those sevens so that they are using less working memory to retrieve those facts and learn the procedures. Have you seen anyone doing anything like that or studying a method like that? It's proven to be super effective for us, but I'm, I haven't necessarily known what to look for in the research to see if anyone else has looked at that. Yeah, so it sounds very smart because you're ensuring that the math facts, it would be the same thing. Let's say you're working on the standard algorithm for multiplication, right? Mm -hmm. You could, if depending, you, uh, and this would require more work for teachers, right? Yes. But yes. I could make sure every multiple law, uh, standard algorithm multiplication problem only includes numbers of facts that kid has mastered. Mm -hmm. right? Now you are ensuring that every fact the student is going to encounter in that problem, the student has already stored. So all of their working memory can be focused on learning that new procedure. The other thing you mentioned about perhaps uh, narrowing the number of new facts taught, that's known as set size in, okay. uh, in one, uh, like, in, well, I shouldn't say that. There, in, in some of the behavioral literature, they'll refer to that as set size. Okay. And so there's a, really good paper by Benjamin Solomon, who's at the uh, university. He was at Oklahoma State. He's now in New York. Um, I think he's at Albany, but uh, you would need to double check. But him and Brian Ponce did a really cool study where they looked at what happens with smaller set sizes versus larger set sizes. And one of the easiest ways to make sure students will learn 
information quickly is to reduce the set size because they're only learning maybe three facts instead yeah. of 10. The yeah. only caveat I'll add to that though, is it sounds great, right? You're like, okay, I've reduced it, the kid's learning. But if you actually have a potential set of 60 math problems, well, now you're like doing these small slices of we'll do four and four and four and four and four. It's going to take a, it's going to take a long time to master all 60. Yes. Whereas if, so Whereas if you're doing like set sizes of 20, you get through 20. And so you just have to be very cautious of considering what is the largest set size that's appropriate for the student to still see that rate of improvement of learning the facts. Because yeah. um, theoretically, if you're learning, if you let's say you have like a set of four and the kid learns it, I can't just go to a new set of four and leave those four in the dust because right. what happens those four are gonna might yeah, be they're gonna get it. deleted right yeah if they're not <laughs> yeah if they're and yeah. that's just the forgetful you can look at any yeah. of, any of the forget forgetful curves sorry um which is why you would need to actually embed those four and distribute mm -hmm. practice across time yes yes um, and that's what we do and i failed to mention that yeah, so, yeah that sounds great yeah, yeah that's, and that's awesome. um in, in the behavioral literature, that can be known as overlearning. So you mm -hmm. might overlearn um, some skills to increase the likelihood that they're going to be maintained. And mm. it's kind of funny. Uh, I, don't, I don't. Well, it's interesting because um, I'm sure you've seen some of these stories where there might be um, people who are older who uh, might have a dementia or something else, and they will be reciting. Uh, um, like songs for, that they learned as children. And you're like, right. what is happening here? And that is like the essence of like, that thing was over learned at one point in time mm -hmm. and it endured throughout time. Um, and so that's basically, if, if you can get the facts to be mastered really well and they are going to be distributed because theoretically you're going to encounter six times four in math somewhere. So yeah. it will be practiced. Um, but it's just, it's not, it's, it's not as strong as you would think though. Um, I think it might've been Solomon. There was someone I was talking to who was looking at curric math curricula and looking at how often kids are exposed to math facts. And it's actually disheartening to know kids don't receive nearly enough exposure to math facts just in a curriculum to ever truly master them. Mm. Furthermore, like some facts get way less uh, exposure than other math facts, which might impact the likelihood that students will uh, learn them initially, but then also retain them long-term by having repeated practice of exposure. Oh, that's really interesting. Do you wonder, I guess I'm wondering, the people that are making curriculum and whatnot, is that something that possibly could be get overlooked because we're adults making curriculum for children and there's like a novelty to it. We worry that maybe these kids will get bored with those things, right? Yeah, I, I, I have no idea. I've never sat on a curriculum development panel. Um, I would assume it is ridiculously hard work to develop oh. a curriculum. I'm but sure. yeah, there's so many ways for it to be lost in the shuffle. Um, even just principles of design. I know it was specifically with uh, additive word problems, we kind of have different types of uh, additive word problem structures. Mm -hmm. And when I use the word additive, these aren't just word problems requiring addition. Additive means addition or subtraction. And you can look within curriculum, Asha Dechendra did some work on this um, uh, maybe like 10 years ago, but mm -hmm. curriculums didn't give equal exposure to all types of additive word problems. And never mind, there's like subtypes within the three there types that get, that get yeah. under, uh, kids get less exposure to. So it's no wonder by the end of third grade when additive word problem is a, it's a pretty core domain within mm -hmm. that kids are gonna get differential level of exposure to specific types of word problems and that's going to impact their likelihood to be proficient in solving them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I totally agree. It's really interesting how that kind of crops up like these silos, you know, we've got these research that's saying this, but we're not seeing it necessarily in curriculum and whatnot. Um, that's really, really interesting. So I want to know then, knowing that maybe the Mad Minute's not the best way to maybe introduce math facts. So what do you think is best practices for 
teaching children math facts that have a learning difference like dyscalculia or just developmental dys dyscalculia. It could be dyslexia, any of those things. What should we be doing then? Yeah, so the big, uh, the big thing is just exposure. Um, so we'll see students who um, are at risk for mathematical difficulty, identified with mathematical difficulty, have a learning disability in mathematics, whatever. Those students are likely going to need more exposure to an individual math fact to retain it than other students might. Mm -hmm. so right, off, right off the jump, you can just know I need to put more time into math fact acquisition instruction for some students than others. And just that knowledge in and of itself is going to go a long way because if you analyze your practice as a teacher, you'll realize how, I don't, not all teachers, but how limited most curriculum are with teaching math facts. Mm -hmm. and so if you're just trying to use a curriculum um, off the shelf, it, there might not be enough exposure to math facts in there. And so you're going to have to supplement. And then that's where teachers are doing, there's some really, I've seen some really great, have you heard of number talks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So great. Verbalizing, talking about math. My one caveat though, is number talks likely are not going to help math fact acquisition. That's mm -hmm. not the goal of them, right? Mm -hmm. You might spend three, four minutes talking about one specific problem, that's not exposure, right? If yeah. I if I was doing if I was doing some sort of peer assisted flashcard math fact uh, intervention of some kind, kids might be getting 20 uh opportunities to respond to math facts in a minute, which would be that would that would be 60 opportunities for them to practice math facts in three minutes versus a three minute number talk where they might be exposed to how many? I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, there are different purposes. So like just knowing like, okay, this number talks might be serving a specific purpose and you're using it for a specific reason. That's great. It, the re, your reason likely is not to enhance math fact acquisition. And so you're going to need to supplement your instruction somehow outside of that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I agree. A lot of parents are watching this show. And so I want to jump back to what what you were saying about, oh, I wrote his name down, Brian Ponzi. So four okay. minutes of math practice. So are you saying can, parents okay. could do this too? Yeah, so here, it's very easy. So my both my kids, I have a five and seven-year-old. Mm -hmm. And my five-year-old right now, um, and I, I want to, I'm not the best parent in the world. She still, ha I can do a lot for letter sound correspondence, CVC, but she's liked math for whatever reason. And so we're currently working on sums to 20 with her. Mm -hmm. she created all of her own index cards. She wanted to write them all. So she created them all. I wrote the answer on the back and she wants to practice relatively frequently. And so uh, usually we'll just do a quick round. You can reinforce, you can score how many they got correct. Kids can goal set. All of that is really great. The, um, and my son's doing like multiplication and division ones and he loves it too. He created his cards. And so it's very easy. Flashcards is one of the most low tech, easy to incorporate. The things you would want to uh, make sure is when you're initially starting, I would, you want to teach the procedure for how you're going to do flashcards, right? So if you're going to expose the, uh, the flashcard to your child, you got to make sure they know what's expected of them. They're going to mm -hmm. say the answer to you. You want them to say the answer relatively quickly. You don't want them to be using a counting strategy. And so with my son, the way I set it, set it up with him initially, I said, okay, we're going to go through some cards. If you don't know the answer in three seconds, I'll tell it to you. You'll repeat it, but I'll put it over here. If you say it correctly, it's going to go in this pile. And so you just have that expectation built in from the beginning. And then he can count his stack of cards that he knows. And time after time, it's going to increase. Um, the other thing with practice time, this is what Duhon and uh, Ponzi had done some work on. They tested mass versus distributed practice. So what that means is, let's say you're like, I have five to six minutes of bandwidth to practice math with my kids at home. Like, believe yeah. me, I know it's a parent. Yeah. And so it's like, you're, uh, I could sit with him or her um, with my kids. I could sit with them for one six minute practice. You with me? So I could sit there for six minutes, we're done, we call the day. The other option is I can do two minutes, 
We can go do something else. I'll do two minutes, go do something else, do two more minutes. Both of those are six minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The the practice where I do two minutes, break, two minutes, break, two minutes, that is going to be more efficient. And uh, it's going to be more efficient for them to learn the facts and more effective than one six minute practice. So the big recommendation I would have is make sure when whatever time you have allocated, if you can break practice up into smaller chunks versus mm. one, one, it's going to be better. And oh, I, yeah. I, I know not all families have the ability to do this, but the neighborhood school I worked at, there was a lot of walkers. So mm -hmm. uh, it was just the way it was set up. And so there was parents who were like, what could I do? I was like, well, if you want to like practice some facts, that would be helpful. They literally did flashcards walking to school. Kids exactly. like did. Parents like, yeah. And so thinking of like small ways to incorporate it, not everyone's this nerdy, but like when I'm driving, if we have a 30 minute drive, cause it's, it's roughly 30 minutes from Oklahoma city and Norman for like five to 10 minutes of it. I just will say a math fact to my son. He'll say the answer. I'll say one to my daughter. She'll say the answer and we'll practice in the car doing it verbally. It's fine. It doesn't have to be written. Right. Mm -hmm. so you can think of really easy ways to just try to get math practice throughout your day in any way you can, right? You can be washing dishes. They can be sitting there. They can be helping you with dishes. Um, yeah, and just, yeah, it's just, it's just about practice and exposure. Oh, I like it. Now I know a lot of math fact programs have songs or rhymes or whatever. Do you have a, a preference about that? I know a lot of families like those, but for me, sometimes what I see is it takes up too much working memory for when we're trying to learn something new and they need to sing this song to get to the answer. What, what have you observed about stuff like that? I don't have much. I actually don't have strong opinions on, on that. I would say though, one, uh, actually, yeah. So I don't have strong opinions, but the one thing I would caution of is some of the songs, um, even my son uh, this year in school, they were doing like the times tables, right? Mm -hmm. So they would be like this, through some song or melody, learning how to skip count by sevens. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. Cool. But then when you expose, when I would expose him to like, Hey, what's seven times three, his initial thought was, let me go to this song and skip count by that. And now once again, that is teaching a strategy, right? Yeah. Which yeah. It's, it's a great, and I want to make this point very clear. That is not a bad thing, right? It is I would, I would much rather have a student know, oh, crud, I forgot what seven times three is. I can go back to this other thing to figure it out. That's showing mm -hmm. mathematical thinking, understanding multiplication is repeated addition. That's great. But we were at this point with him where like seven times three is something we had practiced. Like I want him to think, oh, 21, right? Or at least stop and try to retrieve it versus resorting right to that. And so that would be the one caution of like making sure if we're doing math back practice and we are at that stage where we want quick automatic recall of them is the goal at this stage, then uh, those could get in the way because there, a, a lot of the ones I've seen focus on skip counting. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, this has been such a good conversation. I could just chat with you all day long. I have a feeling, but our time is up. Is there anything else you want to close with to encourage educators about this math fact conundrum of fluency? Yeah. So the last thing I'll say is um, within fluency, speed, it's because I, I see this comment a lot. Like no one is saying, oh, if you're the fastest at math, you're great at math. Mm -hmm. No one's saying that. But being quick with facts and procedures is beneficial. That's like, there's so much out there showing that that's true. And so that's why when we're, if we're doing stuff with math facts and you're like, oh, we'll just wait. I'll have the kids solve 10 and they can take as long as they want. And then you're just scoring for accuracy. Did they get all 10 correctly? I'll paint a very small picture here. Mm -hmm. One student could solve all 10 and it takes them a hundred seconds. Mm -hmm. So that would mean they're taking 10 seconds per problem, likely using some pretty heavy duty uh, counting procedure. Another student solves all 10 correctly. It takes them um, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, right? They're pulling it from memory. Those two students are going to function very differently 
when that math fact is embedded in something else, which is inherently why time, like thinking about time is important in a metric to capture if a student's mastered math facts. That's why timed math practice, but then also timed math assessment for math facts has always been around. Mm -hmm. But I that that's where, <clears throat> oh, the mad minutes are terrible, right? Mm -hmm. so that's what teachers will say because they're used poorly. And I would say, well, then find ways to get around that. Yeah. Right? If And so if you're doing the, the flashcard activity, if you have that ability, like I know most gen ed teachers cannot do math fact assessment with kids because if you have 25 kids in your class, oh, that yeah. is quickly all that time, right? So I understand that. But if you have the capacity where you're going to pull a couple kids, if you're doing the flashcards, that is time as well, but it looks very differently, right? Because mm -hmm. I expose a child to it. If they can say it within three seconds, it goes in the known pile. If they can't say it within three seconds, it will go in the unknown pile. That's still timed, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm getting that understanding of can they answer this quickly, but it, it, uh, that format of assessment functions differently than here's a paper pencil a uh, worksheet of some kind and write them down. Yeah. yeah. Um, the same thing is if you are going to do paper pencil, uh, students can answer it. But like I had, a, I had a couple students who, if they didn't answer all the problems, that really frustrated them. And I've had a couple parents say the same thing. And I would say, well, just cut the sheet down a little bit. Have the student answer all of them. You won't ever stop them. You will just collect duration data. So yeah. if they're going to solve 40 problems or 30 problems, just count how long it takes them to do it. Now you have a metric of fluency still. Yes. So there's really small qualitative adaptions we can make to still get an understanding of that time component that might not look the same as the mad minutes where it's like, hey, everyone, answer this in a minute. I'm going to stop you. And then you run into issues. Um, yeah. yeah, that would be that would be the recommendation I would have, like find creative ways to adapt if you think it's necessary. Absolutely. All right, Corey, this has been such a great interview. Will you share with everyone where is the best place to connect with you online if they have more questions for you? Yeah, of course. Uh, I have a Twitter profile that I post a lot of math research to, um, along with some things I write. Um, and you can find it at Corey J. Peltier. Um, and also, I always love emails if people have questions. And you can email me at Corey Peltier at ou.edu. Awesome. Thanks so much. We'll make sure to link up to that. Excellent. My friends know that I have a math book addiction. So many of them have great ideas and good research, but I'm often left with the feeling of, now what? Exactly how do you teach this? That's why when the Made for Math team set out to write books, we wanted to make sure we didn't leave readers feeling like they needed more. You can get a copy of Math Facts to Memory and be explicitly instructed on how to teach students to add and subtract within 1 and 10. It's a multi-sensory approach and is perfect for parents, special ed, or any professional that does pull out Tier 2 and 3 intervention for students with math learning differences. Inside, you'll find the latest research, tons of games, vocabulary sheets, and detailed instructions on how to guide students. Pick up your copy at shop.madeformath.com.